Thank you. Yep. So the Hangout Air on Air is now live. Um, we have Mahabali joining us. Um, she's at the American University in Cairo. And um, we're here at the Tecnológico de Monterrey campus Guadalajara uh, in Zapopan, Jalisco. This is part of our Semana E activities. This is our digital literacy course, although I should call it digital presence, or Laura corrected me. And I'm here to talk about anything that's digital identity. And uh, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Maha to give an introduction. And thank you for joining us so much, Maha. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So hi, everybody. I'm Maha Belli. I'm an associate professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. And so my day job is mostly about supporting faculty in their professional development, especially with regards to teaching and sometimes with, with, you know, with regards to integrating technology into their teaching. But I think um, I'm more known for my online work because I kind of live online. And I do a lot of things online, including a lot of writing, a lot of tweeting and virtually connecting, which is a lot of similar, very similar to what you guys, uh, what we're doing with you guys here, but usually it's with um, conferences. Um, and so I wanted to know a little bit about you guys. Um, there was a, a discussion on Facebook. I can't remember if it was inside this course Facebook group or if it was on Ken's, um, Ken's wall about whether technology can bring us close or apart. I just wanted to know what it was like. I'm sure if you're undergrads or if you're uh, graduate students or if, I mean, I, I, let, let me know that and let me know what you think of that debate. Sure. So we, I actually showed that image on the screen recently, an hour or so ago. Alex has got his headphone and he's just like cranking away on learning how to do video editing in Camtasia. And we, we brought this up with you, Alex, as well as some other people about that image I was showing of the people that weren't really paying attention maybe to each other. And then I also showed you the videos of, of the baseball selfie girls as well and talking about how people aren't paying attention to what's present in front of them. So maybe who wants to talk about that? What are your opinions? Jump in. And I'm going to move this up. I'm actually going to move the microphone way up in the front here. So we'll actually get a little bit better audio for my students. Are you I'm on a stage? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's weird. I can't believe you're on a stage. How do yeah. you give people hugs when you're on the stage? There's pictures of me on a stage. It's weird. <laughs> so, ladies. What do, you, what do you think about the picture about presence, phone, digital, as opposed to in the flesh? Like, I think um, one of the most important things I've learned, and we have thought through the course, is about the context of everything we do. Like, um, just like posting a picture of yourself with a paper, so people can write anything on that paper. So those are like the basic steps, like for the security of what you're doing, because if you miss out the context, someone can put the context context in the thing. And the context Yeah. Mommy, where are you? I'm here, baby. She's <laughs> <laughs> calling me. My daughter's calling me. All right. <laughs> That's cute. Okay. So, Come and meet Ken and his students, speaking of context, because it's seven at, nine at home. Yes, baby. Do you want me? Yeah. It's okay, don't be scared. Say hi. Look at all these people. Hi, everybody. Look at all these people. Say hi. Okay. So who else has something to contribute? It makes it harder with a mom or a child helping others. Who else has thoughts about that image, the photo you saw? Sonia, and I'm pick on you. You moved up to the front. You got to talk pretty loud though, so she can hear you. I believe uh, that almost everyone uh, posts a picture, but don't really care about what we want to share, but what we want the other people to look about ourselves. Okay. That's like being self-conscious about the photos you pick, you put up. Okay. I can't hear him very well. Um, so so. It, it's about um, making the decision about being self-conscious and posting photos that you might be embarrassed of on your on your blog or other places. 
Mm-hmm. No? More thoughts? It's interesting that he just brought that up because I always think about, I never intentionally wanted my daughter to be on a Google Hangout that's recorded and live streamed. Right. Um, but once she passed a certain age and she could just move in whenever she wanted to, and I couldn't just always have everything when she was asleep. Right. And I just decided that, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't prevent it or else I won't have my online life. And my online life is really important. And she's used to getting on Hangouts because she's used to getting on the ones that aren't live streamed with like Rebecca and Autumn and my online friends and just chatting with them. So, you know, when she grows up, and, I, and this is for you, Oda, when she grows up, I hope she, she won't mind that she ends up with so much of her on the internet. We I never, not. almost never post photos of her on Facebook, actually. That's right, actually. Uh, but she's all over YouTube, <laughs> which is hilarious, <laughs> really. Um, but, um, okay, and she's, by the way, she insisted on having one of the headphones in her ear. So yep. she's listening in. <laughs> awesome. So no swear words because she's no, only five. We, we, we promise. <laughs> what, what are other thoughts about being on video? So I know some people did video. I know Tonio actually posted a video with him and his sister yesterday. What are your thoughts? I know we, we're recording video today as your video safari so you can look at editing with Diego tomorrow. What are your thoughts of like posting your own face on videos on YouTube? <clears throat> You're in the front. <laughs> Yeah, that when you realize that even if you want to prevent yourself from being in the internet, you want to be in the internet, like in the school pictures, in pictures from friends, in everything. So the way you avoid that fear of being in the internet and being what you can go. Who is looking at you? Or which places are you? So instead of avoiding and just being like. Um, going into a cave and not showing up to the world, it's better to be outside and build your own presence in there. Good points. Who else has something to add about, about your presence? We're in day four. I, I'm, my, my goal is that you've changed some thoughts on your presence over this week. I don't know if I've made it, but um, hopefully that's my goal. Other thoughts? Come on, you came to the front. <laughs> And it would be better if you walk up to the front so she can hear you better off the microphone. No. No. How long have you been doing the, the YouTube video thing, Maha? Um, so with virtually connecting, it's been a little, like a year and a half. But before that, like the very first time I did a Google Hangout, um, it was, I think, 2013. And the first one that was recorded and that I watched later was sometime in 2014. And I remember very well. Uh, now, no, I'm, I'm in my late 30s. So these things didn't exist when I was in college. And I, I remember watching myself and thinking, I am such a bubble head. And oh my God, I can't believe I said that. And I can't believe I'm giggling that way. And I hated myself. It's also kind of like, if you ever record your voice, you're very uncomfortable with it at first and thinking that's not me that's not how i sound right and it takes a while to get used to that and i i and it was the same for me with video like i hated myself on video i watch myself and i think i'm such an idiot and i think oh, my text is much more mature than my speech and the thing is we don't watch ourselves interact in daily life but when it's on video you you know you get to see it again and again if you want to uh, but then i got used to it because i realized that this is one of the ways to connect with people because I prefer to connect with people on text or something like Twitter. But I also realized that with some people connecting on video feels much more personal and I wanted to connect with these people. And so I wouldn't go up on YouTube a lot and just record myself talking about something. I, I still don't enjoy doing that. I'll do it occasionally if someone asks me, but I don't enjoy it. But if it's going to help me connect with people and have a conversation, uh, then that conversation is worth it. And I'll, I'll deal with the recording if it's going to benefit someone else later. Right. Um, and I think, you know, people who have family who live far away. Them, does anybody have family? And nobody's saying that, but, you know, especially. Hi. Do you want to say something? Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I have a question. Already. Yes, go ahead. So what's like the hardest part when you start uh, recording and uploading videos to YouTube, like maybe you don't like something about your content or you don't think it's good enough or uh, maybe 
like you said, the voice when you record yourself, something like that? Like, mm -hmm. what's the hardest part for you? So, so there are, there are, that you need to do something about the echo, Ken. Okay. Yeah. So there, <laughs> there, there are, I think, two hard parts about putting yourself up on video on YouTube. Um, one of them for me is that if the video is recorded in any other medium other than a hangout on air at home, it'll take me like two days to upload a, 50, a 30 minute video because my internet connection isn't very good with uploading at home. On campus, it's a little bit better. So, I mean, for me, if I want to, if I want a video to go up on YouTube, I record it on YouTube Live or on Hangouts on Air or whatever, so that it goes directly to YouTube. So that has, that's just a technical thing. Uh, I can't record it on some other thing and then upload it. It's going to take me too long. But the other part is just, I think the difficulty of accepting your spontaneous, your spontaneous identity and what that looks like online. And some people are very, very careful about what they will say online and they'll make themselves more perfect and they'll rehearse what they're gonna say and they'll write it down and they'll make sure it's perfect and that the background is perfect and all that. Um, or they will edit something after they put it up online. Editing stuff after you put it up online, also on my internet connection, very, very difficult. <laughs> very, very difficult. I tried doing it. Like when we started virtually connecting at first, I allowed people the opportunity to say, can you please cut out minute X to minute Y? And it's too long. Uh, and that I just needed people um, to accept that, you know, they're going online and it's going to be live and just accept that. Uh, but if you're if you're doing something else, you can edit it offline and then upload it to YouTube, and that's all, all obviously a lot faster to upload it off, to, you know, to edit it offline. Um, but I think you know the thing with a lot of internet stuff is because it's recorded, we tend to think that it has to be perfect. But if it's recorded as a spontaneous thing, then I think we should be able to embrace some spontaneity in it. Uh, just be careful about certain things that you really, really don't want to be online and just try not to, to do that. There's a, there's a third thing that I haven't mentioned, but there's a risk that I take, especially as a woman, uh, and that someone could take some of my text, uh, some, some, not my text, something that I've said and put it out of context, you know, and, and then use it in some other way and say, oh, look at what she said, you know? Um, but I hope that because the original is available online that people will be able to go and check that. And it's never happened to me before but I try to say that with virtually connecting, we don't have a license on it that, that, that outright allows people to edit the videos. I mean, we hope people will just use a video as is rather than take little bits of it because I worry that people don't want their stuff to they're taken out. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. Okay. The audio is killer for you for feedback because we're coming off the speakers here, so I apologize. I try to jump back and mute ourselves. Um, that brings up to context the, the whole concept of licensing, and we had some conversations about that, and I think actually um, Robin did today on, on Twitter about the YouTube uh, license. The standard license is all rights reserved, basically, and that you can play the video, um, but the only other option on YouTube is like CC BY, basically, if mm -hmm. I'm right. And then they yes, could, I think so. Which is not what we want. We don't want people to cut up our videos and use them. So I think that's a pretty important point. We had that discussion actually in Slack uh, a while ago about this in our virtually connecting Slack. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yep. Um, more into like Ken gave us a link about uh, some of your posts about digital citizenship and that kind of stuff. So what can you tell us about um, having those that kind of citizenship where we are like some students and people like everyday people, how can we actually do something into promoting this ethical issue about raising voices through digital presence? Nice. Okay, so um, there's, I just didn't get the last quest part of the question. Hold on, try again. The last part about... Oh. Like, how can we engage our digital presence into doing this concept of digital citizenship? Right. So, I mean, 
a lot of what you, you, you will find online about digital citizenship focuses on privacy and safety and things like that. And if, you, if you've read my article, I'm not focusing on that at all, right? So I'm focusing on what makes a good citizen in real life. And you said something about being regular people and regular citizens are regular people, right? They're not, I mean, all of us are citizens of some space uh, and all of us are just regular people. Um, and for me, just being a good digital citizen is how to be a citizen online. Uh, and a lot of it is just about your interaction with other human beings online and how you want to be a, both representing a citizen of your geography, but also a citizen of this online space. Um, and so I, when I talk about especially using the digital spaces to create empathy and social justice and trying to understand people who are other than ourselves, different from ourselves. And also, you know, all of us not being from the global north. I mean, I guess Mexico is technically in the north, but you know, you know what I mean? We're not, we're not from America or Canada or whatever. <laughs> um, in that you tend to not be the majority of people online and if you're going to be writing or expressing yourself in English that's not your first language and then trying to so somehow by just being there in that space you're sort of representing not intentionally a culture that's you know that's maybe not as as fully present online um, and one of the things that I think is is really important in in the part of being a digital citizen is as well as having a public digital presence, is to also have a private digital presence. And that's not something that people talk about a lot, but I think it's very important because yes, you can engage online in a public way and get to know a lot of people in a public way through your blog, through Twitter, through Facebook or whatever, which is semi-public, right? Because part of, because for Facebook is just for people you accept into your network, but there are like hundreds, right? How many people have less than hundred Facebook friends? Okay, but most of us have a lot of Facebook friends. <laughs> um, you're probably just very, very discriminating. Um, discriminating not in a bad way. I mean, just you choose who you, you let into your circle. But I mean, a lot of what happens online is about building relationships with people privately. And um, I think, Ken, before you joined Virtually Connecting, I think I was with you on a Twitter direct message where nobody else could see what we were saying, I think. Uh, inviting you to join the team. Um, is that right? Okay. Um, I think a lot of, for example, Rebecca and I, when we co-founded Virtually Connecting, we had never been on a video session before, but we were, um, we had a lot of private conversations that nobody could see on text. And then also even something like Virtually Connecting, which is a session similar to this, like it's live streamed and it's public. A lot of the effort that goes into it takes place in a private Slack uh, you, I know you guys have seen Slack, right? In a private Slack channel where we build our community where we can talk comfortably because we know who's listening to us and we know who's there. Uh, and a lot of the reasons virtually connecting works well is because of a lot of private connections that we make with people. And so you can't build a relationship with 2,000 or 3,000 Twitter followers in the same way that you can build it with one or two or 10 or 20 people in a smaller space. Um, so... There's that. Does that, I don't know if that actually answers your question at all, but you can feel free to rephrase it or ask me a different question. Yeah, I'm unmuting. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah. Awesome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Who thank else you. Has questions? Yeah, we had private, we had private uh, Twitter messages before we did the virtually connecting Maha. I remember running into you once or twice, like a year before. And I kept saying yeah. I want to join virtually connecting and I eventually got around to it. Yeah. So one question we actually had the other day that might be a good one and related to, to virtually connecting is how do you start like a, a personal learning network or a community around what you're working on? Right. So this is another really interesting thing because about, you know, having a good digital presence or identity or, you know, starts a lot with a good being a good audience being a good listener so if we think about virtually connecting as a community that rebecca and i started first of all we didn't start it intending it to be a community but that's what it turned into be but what happened for me personally is that i started by watching other people and what they do and how they behave online because like think about it right if you want to become a doctor 
yeah, you learn medicine, but you also observe other doctors and they're your models and you model yourself after them. If you see, you want to become a teacher, you look at the good and the bad teachers and you try to get the best out of that and try to avoid the worst out of that in what you see other people doing. Um, and so, for example, my first experiences uh, online with online communities, I became part of communities that other people had started. Some of them were ongoing communities like the digital pedagogy community. Um, and I just joined their Twitter chats. I, I participated and watched what they do. I, I just pretty much stalked them for a while to just figure out what they're doing. And now I'm the international director of the Digital Pedagogy Lab, okay? Um, <laughs> I, I joined connectivist MOOCs. And I don't know if you guys have talked about connectivism, but do you guys know what a MOOC is? You know what a MOOC is? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah no. Okay, great. So I joined a connectivist type MOOC called um, Rhizomatic, uh, about rhizomatic learning, it's called Rhizo14. And that one had a Facebook group and a hashtag on Twitter and all sorts of different ways of communicating. But the Facebook group was particularly active. And I was a very, very big part of that. And I watched how that worked. And I watched some of the criticisms of the way it worked. So in some ways, sometimes building a, a community or a learning network you know, a community is a, it's a much cl more closed and more intimate space than a learning network. A learning network would be very loose. Um, but anyway, you know, you look at what other people do and, and you're learning that network of different people that don't necessarily know each other or want to know each other. Uh, but you can help connect them to each other. And you saw Laura and Lee talk to you a little bit about that. And Lee introduced Laura. What I, what I generally started to do was use Twitter as my main personal learning network space and where I would only follow people who were about education. So it was a very professional space for me. I don't look at polit pol political news in Egypt because I realized if I do that, it's just going to take up too much space in that space. Um, and I follow people who follow people that I'm interested in. And when someone follows me, I'll take a look. If they're educators, I'll follow them back. And I try to also engage with people on their blogs, for example. So if I find someone that I'm really interested in and I want to get to know this person, right? I don't usually just tweet to that person randomly. Hey, I want to get to know you. You know, we're not like five-year-olds. Hey, can you be my friend? And can you come and play at my house? You can't do that, right? And so what I would normally do is I would take a look at what they're talking about, see if they have a blog post and put a comment to them over there, hopefully an intelligent comment that doesn't just say, hey, that's a nice blog. Um, or I'll retweet what they're doing, or I'll engage with a question they've asked on Twitter. And, and sometimes even when you don't even know who you want, you'll figure out what hashtag people are using. So when I was doing my PhD, the, I figured out that there were some hashtags that I could use if I had a question. Questions, you, you, you give people an opportunity to help you, and you also get to learn the peop about people who are helpful. So going out there and asking questions is sometimes useful. Sometimes if it's, if it's a topic that you know you can't talk intelligently about, but you want to show people that you care about it, you'll retweet. So for example, on a topic like Black Lives Matter, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that hashtag, but obviously I'm not a black person in America right now. I've lived in America. I don't know what I would count as when I live in America, but I mean, obviously I'm Muslim. It's not very clear what kind of color I am. But um, when I lived there, when I lived there, I, I would probably have had more to say. But right now, all I would do is I would just look at what's happening and retweet whatever people say that I think I agree with, uh, just to show that I care. Uh, and when you do that, people start to notice what it is that you care about, and other people will approach you to get to know you as well. With, with something like virtually connecting, I think what matters a lot is, is how open you want to be to inviting and to including other people um, and being aware of your limitations when you do that. So for example, um, one of the things I really try to do when engaging with your blogs is to read the blogs that weren't in English. So I read a Spanish one and a German one and a French one. And I can read a little bit of all of these languages, uh, but I also use Google Translate to make sure that I didn't misunderstand. And of course, I, Google Translate isn't very good, right? So <laughs> I'm sure there was, I, I wish the guy, the German guy was here because the, his blog was saying something like glassy people. And I think maybe he was trying to say transparent people, but translation came wrong. But with something like this, what we're doing right now is that 
I can't do it in another language or else you wouldn't understand me. Uh, if I did it in Arabic, you wouldn't understand me and there's no way to, to translate that. But just, you know, at least with virtually connecting, we recognize that you wouldn't be able to participate unless you speak the language and unless you have a good enough internet connection to have a meeting like this one. We have a question. Hey, Ken, can you unmute? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, it's kind of long. I hope you get it. Um, I like to write a lot as well. But sometimes uh, I finish writing, then I read it again, then there's something I don't like, so I change it. And I think writing is good because it lets you change um, your ideas once you're done. Instead of speaking that once you say something, the other person heard you and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. but at the end, I think I, maybe I overcorrect my writing. I think, uh, what, what would you say how to find a balance between being spontaneous and then uh, but also being careful about what you say. Great question. You get that very off? good question. Yes, that's a very, very good question. It's very clear and it's not a very long question actually. So, um, so here's, there's, there's several lines there, okay? So I think delineating which of your writing deserves to remain spontaneous and is better when it's spontaneous and which right of your writing deserves to be revised. So I write in a lot of different spaces and on my blog, I'll be pretty spontaneous and it's okay if I make a mistake and I can go and correct it later, but it's not a huge issue because sometimes you're trying to make commentary on something that's very urgent, like something that just happened now and you need to re respond to it right now and you need to or you need to let people know what you're thinking about something. And when that's the case, I won't revise it too much. But sometimes I'm writing for another publication and it's going to be seen by a lot more people than people who follow me personally, who know me as an individual. And for those kinds of things, um, if, if it's something where I need to do some research, then I need to make sure that I'm quoting people correctly, that I'm getting it right, uh, that I don't have spelling mistakes and things like that. Uh, although a lot of the times when you're publishing somewhere else, someone else is editing it as well and checking that for you, but you still need to, you know, submit something that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's in the blog, if you look at a lot of bloggers, some of them write very, very well thought out things. And what you'll notice about people who write very, very well thought out things is that they write much less, much less often. They'll contribute much less. And you know what else? usually have nothing to say to them because they've said it so well that you have nothing to say. But there's someone who will blog something that's an incomplete thought and that encourages you to respond because they're, it's more open, it's more raw. And you can, it's someone who's almost thinking aloud with you. And I love that because that gives you and say, well, this is what I think. The blog, the blog post on my blog that has the most number of comments, it has like 60 comments, is one that I wrote in one minute to read or less it took me one minute to write I I have like want... 20 lines so actually i was Go just ahead. thinking to ask you about that maha that's one i really want to share with them because i found it hilarious that your blog maha's blog shows how how many minutes it'll take to read her blog post and this was a one minute blog post but it just exploded and it was wonderful the conversation that happened there and i'm going to definitely share that with them here after i talk to you Tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to take two hours, two hours to read the comments, but one minute to read my blog post. <laughs> so, so yeah, so if, if you want your blog to be a conversation starter, I don't think you need to, to overthink it. I think you need to keep it open, maybe ask some questions in it as well. Um, and also the other thing is that you get to choose what tone you want to keep. Do you want it to have a personal tone and do you want it to, to feel friendly or do you want it to have like an academic tone and a very a professional tone and you can keep two different blogs for those two different purposes if you like or you can do them both in the same blog so i use the same blog to write about parenting sometimes to write about my feelings sometimes most of the time i'm talking about educational educational technology but sometimes i'll be focusing on my teaching sometimes i'll be sharing ideas about what i want to do in my class and then getting feedback from people and sometimes i'll be reporting about what happened in my class and getting feedback so it really depends on the purpose of each post. So I wouldn't even give yourself, um, you know, I wouldn't give a guideline for all of your posts. I think some posts just need to stay spontaneous. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Does that yeah. help? I unmuted you again. One thing I, I noticed. Thanks for asking that question. Sometimes the long posts intimidate me. Like I'll see Laura Gogia post just an awesome, awesome blog post. And I'm like, oh, yeah, my stuff's not so good. <laughs> so it's, it's good to see like short stuff and see long stuff and, and find your own voice, I think. <laughs> this is what I hope you're finding here. Other questions, folks? While Maha's busy? Who else has questions? Yeah, Orlando, thank you. Come on up. She can hear you, we can't hear her, she's moving. Hi there. Um, Hi. Resetting the question from the beginning, uh, what, what's your opinion on social media? Is it making us more far apart or is it bringing us closer together? I want to know what, what your opinion is. Fernando, can you tell, Fernando, right? Can you tell me very quickly what you think? Sorry? What I think? Um, well, yeah, actually, tell me what you think and then I'll respond. I don't really think it's about social media. Uh, I've always had the opinion that if there's more people, if you concentrate your attention to more people, uh, will bring you farther apart from them. But if there's less people, you will give your all your attention to them. So I don't really think it's about social media. It's about the quantity of which you're directing your attention to. Oh, that is a great idea. That's a great concept because Autumn, whom you guys saw yesterday, she has something. She says something very important about that the more people the more difficult you can okay we can talk to autumn later okay Hoda? okay because Hoda over here likes to talk a lot to autumn and rebecca and it's just the three of us well the four of us because she's there too and that brings her closer to them because they're only four people at a time right um with online like i was saying earlier it's the private and the small communication that brings us closer together oh. now even though social media can give you access to thousands of people you're not talking to the thousands of people at a time unless you're broadcasting and that doesn't bring you closer to anybody but the fact that you guys are coming closer to the screen where i can see your faces i'm having a small interaction with each one of you for a short period of time and if, if that's a sustained thing if we get to see each other like once a week or if i could okay, talk I to you every now and then i need a tea cup. okay go get a teacup Back. Oh, I don't know. Where's the teacup? Does anybody have a teacup? She's looking for a teacup. <laughs> you can use these. Okay, you can use one of these. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the thing is that social media allows you to have both, right? It allows you to have this interaction with a lot of people, but it also allows you to have smaller interactions uh, with a smaller number of people. And those are the ones that build relationships and can bring people closer together. If someone, if, if like my daughter's uh, cousins right now don't live here in Egypt, and so I don't have an opportunity to talk to her cousins at all. Um, many, many years ago, people didn't even have phones that they could talk with using that. But nobody can, nobody's now going to say the fo phones are bad for you or bad for human relationships, right? So I also think that a lot of people who critique um, social media for, for sending people apart or pushing people apart, first of all, probably haven't grown up with it. And second of all, have not had good successful Mommy. interactions with people Mommy. online. The and the third up? thing is just it privileges. Hang on. So I was just going to talk about privileging online versus face to face or the opposite. Up. And what I'm doing right now is trying to balance up. both. There isn't any uh, teacups. Teacups? A yeah, teacup there isn't one. Like you can a use this one. Like this. You can use this one, but don't, don't take it off, OK? Um, is that I'm, I'm trying to balance both, which is really, really difficult if you try to do it all the time, all day long. But if I'm just doing it for an hour or something, I think it, it works out okay. Um, I just, I don't always think that the face-to-face -face has I mean, to take I'm precedence not, every minute of every day. It's fine, I, don't I think to leave it's it for, for, for a little bit. I, I am going to do it again, Rolando. All right. Oh, uh, uh, thank you for your response. It really helped. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Who else? Who else has some questions for Mama today? <coughs> some of the bats coming up. Awesome. No, oh, some of the bats. I am Hondo. Okay, your turn, Alex. We had this discussion earlier. You're key. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you're up here, and all up here. opinions are valid. Okay, I'm going back in. You're up. <laughs> We're on mute. Awesome. Uh, get ready. Okay. Yeah, you're there. So. We had a discussion on Canon that sometimes I think that it's, it's more important to uh, talk to the people that you're having in front of you 
instead of the ones that you're chatting with. Like if you already started chatting with them, then you can say, hey, hold, hold a minute. I'm going to talk to you in, in a second. But I think that it's more important to talk with the people that you have in front. I don't know what you think. It's more important to talk to the person who's uh, in front of you face to face, you mean? Yeah, so like right now, I should um, ignore you guys and focus with my daughter, but she's supposed to be with her dad right now. <laughs> but she just decided to come here. Um, uh, I can't hear you because you're muted. You're really a, a friend of Ken's, right? He said the exact thing. Oh, God. No, I don't think there's anything wrong here. It's, it's, it's I think the point is realizing that people in the virtual space are real people. They can hear me. Shall yeah, hear me? Sure, sure. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's about, um, I think it's a lot to do with present Maha, and, and we were talking about this with Laura, is, is the people in virtual space are people. And I know when I get to meet you finally in the physical space, like you did with Rebecca, it's like we already know each other, and there's just going to be a big hub because they're not just some virtual person out there. It's, it's, it's a real presential person that we know on the internet. More to add, Alex? Yes, yes, because they are, they are other people on the other side. And the thing is Sorry, that when mommy. I, it's okay, do you wanna come here? When Rebecca, when my, when my little girl met Rebecca, she was like, she just, you know, sort of knew her. What are you guys so excited about? We talk to each other all the time. Cause she just knows. Sir, it wasn't like she got like, when when our kids um, are are sad that we're talking to someone else. We'll say, well, there's another person over there. It's not that I'm sitting on my computer writing an article, which I mean sometimes I am, but for the most part, I'm actually talking to another human being. And it human would be being. like nobody's gonna tell me not to talk to my friends on the phone because I have a child at home, right? But yeah, she she gets upset. Uh, but I mean, I'm not going to stop talking to my friends on the phone. Talking to my friends on the phone, only I'm talking to a lot more people, right? <laughs> and she knows that. She can see you guys. Uh. <laughs> we got more questions, folks. I don't, I don't want to take up too much of Mama's time and her daughter's time. <laughs> Who else has questions? I, I think as well, and Maha knows this, and, and most of you aren't parents, is this struggle you have between time for your children and time for yourself is always an issue for us as parents uh, that we have to deal with every day. We have to make choices on our time. Seems crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who else has questions? Are we done? We can catch Maha anytime online. The, the joke is that Maha's always online. <laughs> and, and she wrote a good blog post about this, so you could go check it out. You want to come up to the front and ask a question, please? That'd be awesome. I look weird on the camera this way, so. I have it right up above there. Yep. Um, did you hear me? Straight to the microphone. Did you hear me? Yeah, she can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, how do you decide how much time it's uh, it's good for a video, or uh, I don't know, um, a topic for a video? Or a blog post? Yeah. Yeah. Or blog post. Topic is big enough. What do you mean? How much? How do I decide how much time? What do you mean? Uh, how much time a blog post takes to read or to write? To, uh, yeah, for the user to read. For more for the reader or the viewer. Mm -hmm. so, so how do I write that at the top of my blog post? It's actually a plugin on WordPress that automatically does that. And people have told me, I if I'm answering the right question, let me know if I'm not. Partially, I think uh, it's for um, his decision on how long to make content to not make it too uh, long. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, okay, so, but the, that thing that says how long it takes, that's a plugin that automatically calculates it. But how, to, how long to make a blog post? Um, there is a guideline that around a thousand words is a good length, that longer than that is very difficult to read online. But to be honest with you, it really depends on what you're trying to write. If you're not going to be able to express yourself in a thousand words, it's okay to write a little bit longer. 
but I think if you learn to express yourself within a thousand words, you're more likely to get your points across faster to the reader. Something that goes on and on and on, people won't want to read. But there's something else that says, a lot of uh, journalists will say, your post shouldn't read long. It shouldn't feel like it's long. And I don't know um, if, if English is not your first language, like me, the, the writing style, hang on a little bit. Oh, I've seen some. The, the writing style of each language is different. And so English, English writing is supposed to be linear and to the point, and it starts with making the point pretty early on. But other languages aren't like that. Other languages take a while to get to the point. And so if you, you're, you know, especially, for example, Italian people, they write in very, very long paragraphs that never end. And Libyan people who are in North Africa but were colonized by Italy write the same way. Um, Arabs write in a very flowery way where you use a lot of adjectives that are pretty much synonyms to express your point. And because I'm used to reading in English, the Arabic stuff bores me, for example. <laughs> I don't know what Spanish writing is like, but English, you're used to getting to the point. And one of the things that makes a blog post more readable, even if it's long, is if you have subheadings in bold, or if you have bullet points, then people reading it could read it quickly if they want to decide if they want to read it. And then um, unpack it later, which, for example, is why there's a lot of things like 10 ways to do, I don't know what, 10 ways to be a digital citizen online, or 10 things to improve your digital presence or whatever. And those things are very readable, even if it turns out to be longer than a thousand words, like keep it. That, that kind of thing makes it more readable and easier to read. Um, not having too many photos, but having enough photos to make the point helps a little bit. Uh, not having too many videos, because a lot of people won't have time to watch a video or they'll be reading it when they're commuting. So they don't have, they, they're not really able to click unless there's a reason why it's there. Don't just put videos or photos or whatever for no particular reason. And all of that makes your blog post. And then just using precise and, and catchy and, and useful uh, words for titles, uh, you know, the title of the post and, and the titles underneath it, that helps people read your post a lot. Because I think, I mean, the point is to get people to read it if it's the thing that they're interested in. So it's, it helps to let them know that they're interested in this. If I'm going to write a really, really long blog post, I'll put a little bit at the top that summarizes what it's about so people can decide for themselves. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. If you had some, it, Thanks. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi. Well, it is not that much uh, a question. It's more like an opinion, and it's a little bit out of context. But I don't know if you can tell me a little bit about what do you, what is your opinion on censorship? Okay, well, in general, I live in a very, very uh, interesting context with regard to that. <laughs> I think there's, okay, one very important point is there's such a thing as self-censorship. And I am one of those people who I write very openly about particular things, but I will censor myself to keep my family safe. So I am very, very careful not to talk too much about politics and especially if I'm going to write something that's borderline political I will write it in English and I will not uh, put it in a place where it's going to get translated into Arabic because that way I could get myself into trouble so there's that there's censoring ourselves and the other reason because you know that if you express this view not very well thought out you can hurt other people or you can offend other people and so you're careful not to say it so um, there's that but what are my views on censorship in general? That's a very, very difficult question because let me try to think about someone like Donald Trump. Uh, I don't know if you guys are following the news in, in the US and I'm sorry, I don't know what kind of news is happening in, in Mexico specifically. Um, but, uh, you know, should someone like Donald Trump be allowed to just say whatever he wants and not get, um, not get you know, nobody censor that. Uh, but the, the thing about that is, if he doesn't get censored, as long as everyone who wants to respond to him doesn't get censored, I'm sort of okay with that. Um, I'm trying to think of things. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of something, again, it's very U.S. focused, because that's, that's something that maybe we, we have in common, we look at. So, for example, 
it's not actually not completely U.S. focused. There was a while ago where there were cartoons making fun of Muslim people in Denmark. So they were called the Danish cartoons, and people had different views on what should have happened with those. There's there was an incident in France as well. But anyway, when you post cartoons that make fun of a particular culture. Um, are you inciting violence and are you creating a problem by doing it? But is the solution to that to censor it? I, I really don't know because I think the thing is that what if those cartoons were making fun of, for example, Jewish people or black people in America? Would newspapers censor them? And then that's the question is if you're going to censor or not censor based on something, it should pretty much apply to all cultures or all whatever kinds of discrimination. So you wouldn't say that it's not okay. For example, in, in the US, there are certain words that you cannot use because they are racist and they go back to the time of slavery. And if you use them, they would censor you or you would get into trouble. But you, but you could use very racist words against, for example, Muslims, and that would not be a problem. Or you can't use them against Jews or against homosexuals because those people, tend to have a level of respect, but you can use them against Muslims. So that's why I have a problem with it when it's not applied evenly. So it discriminates against certain people. Um, but I mean, in, in all cases, I think as long as there's an opportunity to, to push back or to respond, the problem is that the response might not get as much airtime as the original offense, right? So someone like Donald Trump, who's applying to be a president, not applying to be his presidential candidate, I mean, gets everybody gets to listen to that because of his power and his position and all that and so if i responded to something that donald trump said like there may be two thousand people who will see it versus when he says it and millions and millions of people say it uh so i i really don't know that's because yeah it's a very generic question but i i also think about censorship in terms of myself as a parent for example do i want my parent to go onto youtube and see anything or see ads for things that maybe are, are not appropriate for her age uh, and what I've got right now is I've got an ad blocker that prevents any ads from showing. But she could still click on something on YouTube that I don't want her to watch. And it's it's a little bit scary to think that I might not be sitting next to her. So I will just try to sit next to her. Um, but yeah, because, I, because you didn't give me any specific context, and I think you did that on purpose for some reason. <laughs> uh, this was a just very rambling kind of uh, response to that. But if you want to ask a follow-up question about a very particular thing that relates to your context or... No, that, that was uh, actually really nice, a very good and great answer. Uh, Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. More, more questions from anyone? We're pretty much out of time. I don't want to uh, take all your time as well as Maha's. This has been really good. I really like this. People are starting to open it up. It, it was hard with Dave in the first morning because we didn't have any prep time. He just jumped in at the beginning. Um, but the questions have been good so far this week, so I'm really happy. Anything else people want to add? I am actually showing the uh, your blog post about when does Maha sleep. I'll, I'll talk to you. Later. <laughs> you but can let them play that, play that game as well if you want. Sure. And it, it's, yeah, there was a good game. I'll, I'll share that later. But it's a good example of, of you're putting things into bullet points and, and breaking it down and what you were talking about right now. And I want to share the post about the, uh, the domain of your own. We'll talk about that as well. How, how blog conversations can happen. They spent some time today, I, I was making sure they're not just writing their own stuff, but they're going out and reading each other's blogs and learning how to go out and learn from the styles of others by reading their blogs, because I think we all do that, like you said earlier. I agree. It's the best way to learn. Okay, so once, oh, here, we've got another question, yay. Yay. Hi. Hi. The so, boys are so much more on the screen today than the girls. <laughs> Go ahead. So if you are going to treat like something that you would like to have a real impact on people, what would you choose? Uh, to make a blog post or to make a video? A blog post or video? I would make a blog post. Um, oh, wow. That's a very good question. I make a blog post, that doesn't mean that other people wouldn't make a video. Because some people express themselves better on video and some people express themselves better on a blog post. Um, but for me, I think writing, it's a very, it's, 
that I hadn't thought of that. You're asking me questions that I hadn't thought about. <laughs> but I think that, okay, so there are two things about reading that are, I think, writing and reading that are better than video is that I can embed a video inside a blog post and that would be fine if I needed to. But embedding writing into video is much more complex and much less readable, right? But I could write a blog post and link to a video or in, embed a video or put a photo and that would be part of the writing. And it's just be a multimodal type of writing. And the other thing is that, well, three things now. So the second thing is that writing is searchable. That's the most important thing for me, is that if I write a post about digital citizenship and I put social justice in there, then when you search about these two things, you'll find my posts. But if I do a video and the title of it just has digital citizenship, but it doesn't have the word social justice, when you search YouTube, you're not going to find it. See? But the, the written thing, you can find everything that's been written in it, or you can put a lot of, you can put tags on a YouTube video too, uh, but those will be the tags that I choose that I think are related to my post. But with writing, you can find stuff that I didn't think was what you were looking for, but you'll find it. Uh, the third thing is just that writing is loads easier on more people's uh, devices. So like I said, if I do a lot of my reading and writing um, when I'm on the way home from work. And in Egypt, we have 3G. And it's not very fast. And we don't have like... Uh, and sometimes from some people's homes, it's slow to load. And so, for example, if I wanted to share something with my students, I would rather write it down than do a video for them, unless it's something very, very short, like five minutes, uh, because I don't want some people to not be able to load it. Having said that, this is me and my generation, and maybe th this generation of students would prefer a video than something that's written, just because they'll more, they're more likely to watch it or listen to it. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So you didn't give me the option of audio. You said video or text, right? But there's also the option of audio and a podcast. And that has an advantage over video in two ways. You can download the audio pretty fast, not like video. It's more difficult to download video. So you can download a podcast on a, on a mobile device or an iPod or whatever and take it with you when you're driving to work or to school or walking or exercising. I listen to podcasts when I'm cooking. And so there's, there's that. That's another option that, you, that one could use. Uh, but again, I think I just sound more intelligent when I write <laughs> than when I speak. Uh, but I'll, I'll use all the different modes for different things in my life. Uh, but my preference is always for, for the written one. And also partly because it's easier to edit. You know, if you make a mistake, it's easier to go back and correct it. You can update it more easily. Like sometimes I'll write something and something will happen afterwards and I'll just put a little note at the bottom, update, this since this happened. Does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. What, what would you prefer though? What do you prefer? Do you prefer to express yourself on video or in writing? Mm, well, I think that it, it will depend because I think that if I would try to show some feelings, maybe I would make a video. That's a really, really important point. And, and one of the things I discovered with meeting people this way is that it does, that the emotional and social factor is much stronger with video than in writing. So I can build a lot of relationships with people via just text, but with the video, you can much, much more naturally express emotions. You can learn to express your emotions through uh, writing, uh, but it's, it takes some level of interpretation on the recipient much more than video because video is just more similar to our face-to-face -face interactions, right? So yeah. thank you for that. That's a very good point that you made. Thank you. Thank so you. I'm going to get close to wrapping it up, and I want to say thanks, Maha, for, for mentioning the audio because I'm a big I wanna, podcast listener. I think it's really important. <laughs> I want to listen. I want to listen to a girl. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I've had I've I've given a lot of attention to the boys because the boys came up here, and, and there, there is one girl who's right in front of me who's asked a couple of questions already, but I'd I'd love to listen to another girl just before we go, if that's okay. No, no questions, no comments. Women not answering enough questions. I don't want to. I I get to talk to Ma all the time. No? Okay. No. <laughs> I'd love for you guys to contact me anytime if you have any questions or if you want to talk about anything. I'm, I don't sleep a lot. Really, I don't. <laughs> so oh, sure. you'll find me. Thank you so much, Maha. This has been wonderful. Um, I, I thank you. Thank for you your so time. much for having me. 
And uh, thank you for bringing me into your uh, your group because this has been great over the last few months. So let's say thank you to Maha, please. Thank you. Thank you. And Have a good day. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut down the feed here, Maha. Yes. Doing sure. the production and talking at the same time.